Lifetime. Great, thanks for the introduction. So you notice that my slide deck does not say UC Berkeley. It says Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Yeah, I see a lot of smiles in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so this program has been very successful for me. It really guided me into the National Labs. Conversations with the staff that attend these meetings. I remember having a conversation with Alan Wan about two years ago, and he kind of directed me more towards Lawrence Livermore than Los Alamos. It was a very specific thing that, you know, he said that clinched uh, my decision, and it kind of stuck with me over the couple years. I'll let him tell you that story. It's more of a personal thing. And uh, I've been in Lawrence Livermore as a postdoc for about five months now. So I finished in December at UC Berkeley, and I've really enjoyed my time. Um, I've switched fields to shock physics, so today I'm going to talk about my thesis research, but I've had no problem switching to a different field of science. All the experience I've gotten at this conference in the past has really helped me understand the applications and the very breadth of field within the studies of the NNSA. So, um, I'd recommend all of you students, all of you fellows, to seriously consider applying to um, the labs. Um, it's a great opportunity. You get to work with the best facilities, the best people, and you really do cutting edge science for good applications. So, without further ado, I'm going to move into my thesis research. Let me begin by telling you where I fit in. Nuclear science um, has many applications, and we want to know these for energy, for defense, for just plain curiosity. So energy reactors use nuclear physics. Bombs have a lot of nuclear physics involved, and so do stars. And a lot of the students here, they study all three of these um, topics. I fit more into more general radiation transport. So a given simulation has many different levels of resolution. You might be studying the molecular dynamics or just the atoms individually. You might be studying the grains or you might be studying the, the fluid as a whole or you might just be worried about an energy yield, some final result. I fit more up towards the top in the atomistic range. I study individual interactions of radiation with matter. So we want to know how gamma rays transport through Maybe it's a cloud of debris, or a reactor, or a star. As these gamma rays pass through the material, they either are going to generate more gamma rays, or they might have enough energy to liberate a neutron from the nucleus. And the simulations that we do rely on a wealth of nuclear data. So I don't study every single gamma ray that's possible of coming out. I study a more averaged approach modeling this transport. Now, let me first talk about some fundamental nuclear physics. Um, you guys all study very different things. Nuclei can be excited. So maybe this is a duh, maybe not. Maybe this is your first time attending a talk on nuclear physics. But nuclei are not, nuclei are not all that different from atoms. We use similar models. In nuclear physics, we have the shell model, just like in um, physical chemistry. And you have closed shells of nucleons that fill orbitals below the Fermi energy. And you can promote these nucleons up into higher orbitals to excite the nucleus. And what we assume when we model this series of excitations is that we have equal orbital spacings and that protons and neutrons pair with themselves. And then it takes energy to break them apart. It's pretty simple assumptions that go into our models. But then this tells us a lot of what we need to know when we average our um, models to, to generate data. So let me give you an example of an excitation. You just take the lowest occupied orbital, or sorry, the highest occupied orbital and promote it to the lowest. You can kind of step up additional excitations. You can go even go farther into the core and promote those nucleons. And then if you tabulate these energies of excitation, you get something like a staircase pattern. 
And this is a logarithmic increase in the number of levels with excitation energy. So it says that there are many more combinations possible for higher excited states. We tack on one additional assumption that you might have collective excitations of the nuclear matter in which the proton and neutron clouds oscillate about one another. So this just adds some simple multiplicative factor. On top of all of these excited states, you might have some collective motion within the, the nucleus. So we call this a, a constant temperature model. And a, the, the thermodynamic definition of temperature is just the energy derivative of a logarithmic level density. So one of our simplest models is just says that this is a straight line. OK, so that's covers that, that, cover, that covers excitations. Now what about transitions between those states? So you might have some crazy configuration of excited neutrons and protons within your nucleus. It decays to some other crazy configuration, maybe less crazy because it's lower in energy. And then there's a simple operator that connects these two states, typically photon emission. Now what governs this transition is what we call in quantum mechanics a matrix element. So to determine this matrix element, you take one crazy wave function, multiply it by another crazy final state wave function. You have some operator in the middle. For dipole photon emission, this is just a linear operator. And this can be just a spatial distribution of probability density. Now, this matrix element squared is proportional to your transition rate or if you put it in other dimensions, a transition width. The inverse of the transition width is proportional to the lifetime of the state. The amount of time it takes for this wave function to decay into another wave function. There are many other possibilities. You don't have to decay into just one. You sum up the individual transition rates to find out your total transition rate. This is just one partial channel of decay. Now, Usually we have no idea what this integral is because nuclei are chaos. The strong force is very complicated. We can't write it down. We can't write down the potential for the strong force. So we assume that this integral is just a Gaussian distribution. This goes into averaging the properties of nuclear matter. We can't know every single wave function of every single state when we want to think about things like a reactor. It's just too much physics to put into one simulation code. So we have to make simplifying assumptions. So if you think about it, it's very unlikely that these wave functions completely overlap. If you have some chaotic wave function and another equally chaotic wave function, there's a very low chance that you have perfect matching between the two. It's also very unlikely that you have perfect anti-overlap, meaning you're not going to get a perfect mirror image of your wave function, initial and final state. So this probability distribution tells you what your wave function is most likely to be. It's most likely to be zero. That means that there's all the positive parts of this product of wave functions just cancel out. Now, if you sample from this probability distribution and square it, because it's the uh, magnitude square that determines your transition rate, then you get a Porter-Thomas distribution. Paul Fanto talked about this in his poster, so if you're interested more, you can talk to him. So this distribution is pretty random, and we can at least know the average of this distribution. Nuclei are like basically antenna. They have a certain size, and it's very unlikely that your antenna will emit something much larger in wavelength than the size of it. So the nuclei have uh, a radius of about maybe a couple Fermi in length. So there's not going to emit a meter's length of, it's not going to emit uh, a photon with a wavelength of a meter. That's very unlikely. So to describe the average of this distribution, or essentially like the size of your antenna, you can think about it. We use gamma strength. And this is what my thesis measures, is gamma strength. It describes basically what energy is most likely in gamma ray emission. 
Now, there are different types of photon emission. So I include an X and an L. That's not the size of your shirt. XL, it describes, <laughs> describes whether the photon emission is dipole, quadrupole, or octopole. And then the X depicts whether it's an electromagnetic transition, or electric transition or a magnetic transition. The gamma strength involves those transition rates that we talked about earlier. But then it divides out some prefactors that deal with the phase space of the photon emission and level density. So your average width is somewhere in the middle of this probability distribution, and you have a very small chance that your width is maybe something like 100 times your average. And you have a very large probability that it's like 10% of your average. So this is a very violent distribution of probability widths. And this incorporates a lot of the chaos of nuclei. Now, gamma emission is not the only decay channel, we also have neutron emission that competes with gamma ray emission when there is enough energy to boil off a neutron or a proton or any other type of small particle. So imagine this scenario. You have a nucleus, gamma ray comes in, gets absorbed, and promotes a couple nucleons to higher orbitals. So what's going to happen? Well, one scenario is that it decays and one of the protons, one of the, one of the neutrons flies off. There's enough energy in the excited system for this to occur, or we can rewind. And another probability is that one of the, uh, a gamma ray is emitted, and now you don't have enough energy to emit any particle. So you'll want your code that does all of your simulations to know whether there's more wave function overlap with neutron or gamma ray emission. So some of the first experiments that measured this gamma ray strength just measured photoinelastic cross sections. Gamma ray strength has this simple relationship to cross section. So the first experiments that were done was just a beam of photons hitting a target. More photons scatter out. You, you count all of those photons coming out. You come up with the cross section. And now you know uh, an idea of your average matrix element. Now this has some issues because there's not a whole lot of levels associated, there's not a whole lot of lev levels at low energies in nuclei. So you're going to run into those very strong fluctuations um, associated with chaotic nuclei. Now if you take a very high incident beam of photons, very high in energy, then you can still measure cross sections, but now neutrons are coming out it's much more likely to emit a neutron than a, than a photon at very high nuclear excitation energies. So you just change your detectors, you use green detectors instead of gray detectors, <laughs> and you still do the same counting procedure to get a cross section to determine your gamma ray strength. Unfortunately, you can only do this with stable targets. If you want to know uh, gamma strength, if you want to know neutron transport and radioactive elements, you have to resort to, to different methods. And this is what my thesis did. I m came up with a new method to determine gamma ray strength. So I used the technique of lifetimes. So as we talked about earlier, gamma strength is related to width, and width is inversely proportional to a lifetime. Now we're going to need a lot of lifetimes because there's very strong fluctuations. So that's why I'm going to go into the quasi-continuum where there's a lot of transitions available. We need to compare these transitions on a time scale of something we know very well. It has to be on the order of the emission time. For nuclear physics, we know that most of the transitions are on the order of femtoseconds, maybe sometimes as long as a picosecond. And this time scale is about the time scale of charged particle recoil. So if you knock a nucleus and then it starts scattering in your target, it slows down on the order of about a femtosecond. So I have an experimental analogy for everyone who's fallen asleep during my talk, can now maybe pay attention. So imagine you're on the highway and there is a small little Volkswagen about to hit a car, or about to hit a bus full of school children. And they, 
they run into each other and they, they scatter off the road and they slam on their brakes, leaving behind these tire tracks. And this bus of children are screaming as this, this vehicle is slowing down and their screams are Doppler shifted. <laughs> so you're an innocent bystander wondering how long do these children scream? And you know from the tire tracks how long it took them to slow down. And you know that the children's screams are Doppler shifted. If the bus is moving towards you, you're going to hear a high pitch. If the bus is moving away from you, you're going to hear a low pitch. And so you know uh, the distribution of scream frequency. If it takes very long for the children to scream, then they're going to be screaming while the bus is still stopped. If they scream on a very short time scale, then their screams are going to be much higher pitched because they're screaming while the bus is still in motion. And if the scream frequency is kind of distributed, then it's on the order of the bus slowdown time. So now for the real experiment. Now, we have a beam of protons coming down a beam pipe. This is done at Argonne National Lab and using uh, the Atlas facility, which sets the beam um, energy. We have a target of iron 56 in the scattering chamber, and we have a phoswitch wall determining the energies of the scattered protons. The gamma rays emit from the iron into a detector of germanium, which we call Gratina. And you are Gratina listening into iron 56 uh, emitting these gamma ray screams that are Doppler shifted. Okay, so we have good post-processing control of this experiment. We can tabulate our events and measure Doppler shifts. So, imagine a situation in which iron 56 moved to the left. It's going to emit low energy Doppler shifted gamma rays. If the iron 56 moved towards the right in the same direction as the gamma rays, then you're going to experience, you're going to detect a higher energy. And you can kind of see that this has a slope. So if the gamma rays were emitted at much later times after the slowing in the target takes place, then you would have just seen something flat. So there's at least some evidence of Doppler shift here. Now, if we were to actually measure the, the velocities, we would have, ex the initial velocities, we would have expected a much higher slope, much stronger slope. But as it turns out, the scream duration of the gamma rays is on the order of the slow down time of the nuclei. So I don't only measure the, the scream at the lowest energy, I can kind of measure it at various excitation energies in the level scheme. So I'm looking at one particular transition down here. This first panel is just initial population of that state that decays. But I also look up at higher excitation energies, higher in the level scheme, that first need to emit a gamma ray and then emit some other gamma ray. So it's like maybe on the bus, Susie's scream causes little Billy to scream. You can think of it like that. And then very high up in the, the, the level scheme, then you have um, very fast transitions. There's many ways for this to decay, so these transitions are very fast, and the slope of this Doppler shift changes as a function of excitation energy, and that's going to tell us our gamma strength function. So um, I know these excitation energies because of the amount of energy that is deposited in the nucleus from the scattered proton. Okay, so I take a forward analysis approach. I have my experimental Doppler shift as a function of excitation energy. Um, so there's a few points here. If I populate the level directly, then it's going to have the highest slope because you only need to emit one gamma ray. If you go up higher in excitation energy, then you need to emit um, a, a precursor gamma ray before your probe gamma ray. Now, I don't have great excitation energy resolution so that this first this first point here is a little smeared. It kind of overlaps with my direct point. OK, but if I go up higher in excitation energy, then I, I clearly know that I first need to emit a gamma ray from this excitation energy and then emit a second gamma ray, which is going to be Doppler shifted. You go up higher, 
the transitions get faster, so the slope uh, increases of the Doppler shift. And then if you go up very, very high, then you, okay, you need to emit multiple gamma rays before your probe gamma ray. Okay, so then I take um, a simulation code that I wrote, compare a couple of normalizations of the gamma ray strength function, and normalize my gamma ray strength function to match my experimental data. So I have three normalizations tabulated here. I can get the normalization of the gamma ray strength to about 10-15% uh, through a forward analysis approach. I can then plug this into other codes that determine cross-sections for radiation transport. So if I want to know a cross-section of iron 55, which is radioactive, I can't go into a lab and measure it. I have to use something like this gamma strength normalization into my code to constrain a cross-section. And one final slide. If I can extend this method and determine radiation transport properties of a lot of nuclei in the chart of the nucleides. So these black nuclei are stable. And where there is a green reaction above are our current methods. We can access uh, cross-sections. But with my method, you can add all of these pink reactions below to measure cross-sections through an indirect uh, measurement of gamma strength. Okay, so I'd like to thank my collaborators, my sponsors. Thank you very much for the money. Uh, no refunds, but I'm sure you got your money's worth because I'm at Livermore now. <laughs>